Okay, let's talk day 11 advent of code. The problem for day 11 part one was this grid, which is given of dead space and galaxies. The galaxies are represented by hashes. We have to find the distance, the shortest distance between two points or two galaxies for every pair of galaxies with one catch. Anytime we have an empty column or an empty row, that column or row needs to be twice as big. So we get our input and we can parse out the galaxies and everything just fine. But when we do the calculation for the distance, we have to do a Manhattan distance, which we'll talk about in a second. And we have to do that based on the expanded grid. We get four different test cases here, or rather we get four different examples of what needs to happen for a single shortest path. So taking it to day one, my first step was to parse out the empty rows and to parse out the empty columns. We do both of these in much the same way. Rows is significantly easier because input.lines gives us each of the lines. And since we enumerate, we know what line we're on. And if any character in that line is not a dot, then we have an empty line. So that gives us the empty rows. Same thing for the empty columns. As you can see down here, it's the same logic. The only difference is that we don't have a dot column, right? We have dot lines, which gives us rows, but we don't have dot columns. So what I do is I take the dot lines and turn every line into an iterator. So we have a line dot cars for every line. And then I used from function, which we've used in past days now, to iterate over all of those iterators in step. And what this does is it basically packs a vec and returns that vec so that at the end of this iterator, it's pumping out columns packed into vex. And then once we have columns, we can just iterate in the same way and detect whether they're empty or not. This was the, I guess, simplest modeling of it that I could think of, basically step once for every line. Um, but as we'll see in a second, I was writing this problem with a headache. So I think one of the most interesting things about this day is the tools I relied on to debug this as I was building it. And that is the tracing crate. So here we're iterating over mutable reference to columns. That gives us mutable access to these iterators. If we look at this type, we get and mute cars, which is each of the individual iterators. We can then call next because that we have that mutable reference. And if we get a car out of next, then we push that into this intermediate vec that we're going to produce at the end as the item for this iterator. And if we hit none, that means all of them are done because they are all the same length. So if one iterator is producing none, then all of them are gonna produce none. And this iterator has no more values to produce. Third, we need to find the galaxies. This again is just a matter of enumerating over the lines and for each line enumerating over each of the characters. We use a filter map here to be able to return each of the galaxies. We use an IVEC2 from the glam crate with an X and a Y position. If it's not a galaxy, we don't care about it. So it gets filtered out here. Each of these lines, as we discovered earlier when we were doing the columns, will come back as its own iterator because we're not collecting here. So to get rid of that extra level of indirection, we flat map, which will put all of these together. And what we end up with at the end is a VEC of IVEC2s. Now, due to basically coincidences about how this iteration order happens, it's left to right for each line. The IDs for these hashes match with the indices of this VEC. This is important because in our document over here, they refer to Galaxy 1 and Galaxy 7 or Galaxy 3 and Galaxy 6. And when debugging, it's really nice to have those numbers in the way that they've defined them line up with the numbers that we have. So that's why they're in that order in that vec. At one point, I was thinking that this could be a hash set or something like that instead, but the order here is really useful for debugging and that's why it's in a vec. So then we print out the galaxies in debug format using tracing. And this is where tracing gets really interesting. So we take all the galaxies and we iterate over them. And then we get all of the combinations of two different galaxies. So one and two and one and three and one and four and so on and so forth. So we get them all. This S then is a vec of those combinations. This combinations function came from iter tools, which you can see here in the docs. So combinations uh, for let's say one to five with groups of three, one, two, three, one, two, four, one, three, four, two, three, four, et cetera. So all the combinations for a particular size. Now, like I said before, I had a pretty massive headache. So I was having trouble keeping track of anything while I was writing this for the first time, which means that I relied on this tracing information very heavily while I was writing this. So the first thing we do is get the ID, so the VEC position of the first galaxy. So this is this S here is a 
two item VEC. We get the position in the VEC of the first galaxy plus one, which is the ID of that galaxy. We do the same thing for galaxy B. Then we create a tracing span at the info level with this name. And I specially construct this ID to be the minimum of the two galaxy name IDs and then the maximum. So it's min dash max for the IDs. So now whenever I run this code, if I CD into day 11 here, in my MVRC, I have a bunch of Rust logs for all of the examples that we saw. So if I uncomment one of these, well, first let's let's run it first. So if I take Gargo next test run dash p day eleven part one. So that is the day eleven package. That's the pa crate that we're in. Part one is happens to be the tests in part one. And then Rust log info when we run this will include all of the tracing information as we can see here. So this is just everything. This is absolutely everything for every single galaxy combination. Obviously, this is not great to look through, right? If I'm trying to debug a specific combination, if I'm trying to check something, that doesn't work all that well. It's all the information, which is great. And I can just command F through that, or I can save that out to a file or something. But the really interesting part comes when we want to filter for one of these. So we can use this filtering syntax. In this case, I'm looking for a span named Galaxy Map Span, which is the name of the span that we used, with the IDs 5 to 9. And we're setting that level to info. So in my case, I've allowed this derenv to dump that variable into my environment. So you can see that Rust log came out. If I show you env.rustlog, because I'm using new shell in this case, it shows you that value that we just used. So if we get rid of the inline info here and we use that environment variable and we run the no capture, we're looking for five to nine now. Well, when we scroll up, all we have are the logs for galaxies five and nine. So this is what I used to filter down, even though I was leaving all the logs in so that I could see the steps for every individual comparison of each galaxy, which was galaxy one and seven, three and six, eight and nine, and so on. Because having a headache meant that I could rely less on keeping more stuff in my head. So I leaned heavily on this tracing information and the ability to filter that down to just what I needed to look at. And then I just went, okay, Galaxy 5. Galaxy 5 is position 1.5. So we end up with 1.6 for Galaxy A expanded, and we end up with 5.11 for Galaxy B expanded, which was position 4.9. Does that sound right? Yes, expand 1, expand 2. And then for the other one, expand 0, expand 1. And it's all just right here. And I can filter down to whatever I need when I need it without needing to you know, add logs, remove logs, etc. The way this works is inside of this map, we've got this span getting created, right? So this is all debug information set up here. We've got the galaxy map span. We've got that IDs field that we can see right here. So IDs 5-9. We've got the AID here. We've got the BID here. We've got galaxy A in its IVEC2 position. We've got galaxy B in its IVEC2 position. And then inside of this map, we get to open up this span with a closure and then we do our work. And anything in here with this info now has all of this info that we set up up here in the span. So this starting piece of the info block where it's a galaxy map span, all of these fields sit right in there. So now we get that context, but we also get the information that we're logging out. In this case, I'm logging out expand steps columns and expand steps rows. So you can see that here, here's the information for the X and Y expansions, as well as the context for which galaxies we're working with and what their starting values were. So now anything inside of this closure, we can consider just our map function as usual. So for Galaxy A expanded, we start a new block. We can see it starting on 89 and ending on 114. We take the empty rows and we check to see if the index of the row. So remember, empty rows stores all of the indices of the rows that are empty. We check to see if any of those rows are bigger than our current Y position. And if they are, we get the position of the one that's bigger or we're at the end and we need to use them all. So this number then becomes how many times we need to expand. And then the same thing happens for columns. So when we go to add for Galaxy 1, or Galaxy A in this case, we add Galaxy A's X and Y to the expansion steps. In this case, it's expand uh, from 1 to 2. So it's exactly the same as the number of steps. So we add these two ivec 2s together. Galaxy A expanded becomes the new position, the expanded position of Galaxy A. And we see that logged out with that info right here, 1, 6. And that's this info log right here. We do the exact same thing for Galaxy B. This should probably be, you know, a function that I abstracted somewhere. It wasn't, but we do the exact same thing, exact same logic. We just pass in a different Galaxy. We check to see how many rows we need to add or we add them all. Same thing, add the IVEC2 to the IVEC2. 
which adds x's and adds y's. The calculation for distance then becomes that expanded position for a and the expanded position for b subtracted. That could be negative, so we absolute value it. And once we have this v, v dot x plus v dot y is the distance. Now, we don't need to absolute value this because I have one here, but uh, like I said, <laughs> I had a headache and uh, maybe I wasn't thinking about where my absolute values needed to be. Then we log out that distance, so we have the distance here, and that means that we get to be able to filter for any combination for how much it should be expanded, how much it was expanded for A and for B, and then the distance for that grouping. Then we return our distance value when we sum them up and we're done. So highly, highly suggest using tracing if you need to do things like filter down log lines, if you need to lean on this information for some reason heavy, but also uh, this translates to production as well. Tracing can export to things like open telemetry and you can do all of this filtering in some UI somewhere. Now part two, because we did part one with an expansion of two columns, we get an expansion of a million columns or a million rows, either way. So we get a number for 10 times larger, we get a number for 100 times larger, and we get a number for a million times larger, or we don't get a number for a million times, but a million times is what we need to do, which is a very large number. So the fact that we're adding the IVEC2s together here really helps out because when we take the number of steps that we need to expand, we can expand for the number of times we need to do it times the expansion size we need to expand a million, 10 or 100 or whatever, because this needs to be 999 or 99 or, you know, 999,999, something like that, because we already have one of these columns for the original column. So we just need to add the other 999. This number is passed into the process function. So we pass in the expansion size, we apply the expansion size to the IVEX. I chose to upgrade to an i64 VEC2 instead of an iVEC2, which uses uh, i32s, because the problem said something along the lines of, however, your universe will need to expand far beyond these values, which told me that I should use the largest type that I could use here. And then going down to RS test, I passed in 10 in the value and 100 in the value and ran the process with that uh, distribution, which works for part two just as well. The interesting part of using that and then going to run the benchmarks is that our day 11 benchmarks run the exact same timings for all of our processing. So no matter how much we expand, it always runs in the same amount of time or basically the same amount of time. So not only for part one, but also for part two, for 10, for 100, for 1,000, for I think, was that 100,000? I skipped one in there <laughs> and then a million. The benchmark setup for that is very interesting because it allows us to use this array of consts here. And then our benchmark takes a const argument. So const n here, which is going to be each of these inserted in a row. And then we can run that part two process using that n const argument and do the benchmark for each of these. So you can see here that our part two uh, benchmark accepts each of these consts in a row. We use that const as the input to process, which tells us how much to expand by. And that ends up giving us this output here, which gives us just another tree and tells us what the number was that we passed in, as well as the time it took to run. Now, this isn't the fastest solution. I haven't spent any time debugging it. I wasn't thinking much about performance when I wrote it. So I think I'm just going to leave this, but I, it's worth saying that I'm sure there are faster solutions. All that said, I think the big takeaways here are how easy it is to benchmark with additional kind of arguments. So we can benchmark across a number of different input sizes. Uh, we can do that for Devon. And we can also do the same thing for Criterion. So I have the Criterion benchmarks like this as well. So if we run the benchmarks here, the Devon benchmarks always run first. And you can see all of the uh, inputs coming in here about 23 milliseconds approximately. So now that our benchmarks are done, took about two minutes. If we open target criterion report index.html, we get the criterion sort of UI here. So we can look at the benchmarks for part one, which is just this. It's our graph with kind of the average runtime and the probability distribution of those runs as they happened. And if we look at day 11 part two, we can see all of them compared on the violin chart. So I'll zoom in a little bit here and you can see them labeled here, part two, part two plus 10 plus 100, 1000, 10,000 and so on. And they're all running in approximately the same. We've got charts for each one of them. Some of them are a little bit noisier than others, but they're all mostly, you know, pretty similar. So that's it for day 11. Some interesting tracing tidbits here. 
some interesting benchmarking tidbits here. I think the problem itself probably reused a lot of the concepts that we've already used over the course of Advent of Code in terms of iterators, in terms of IVEC2s, in terms of all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Manhattan distance is new. And I probably do a few more iterations over the input here than I need to do. But overall for me, it was a very big focus on getting this debug information and then on the other end, setting up these benchmarks. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day.